If you're a Disco Elysium fan, then you probably don't need me to tell you that the game draws a parallel between Dolores Day, the innocence and founder of Delorianism, and Dora Ingerland, Harry's former fiance. This becomes explicitly clear during Harry's dream at the Sea Fortress, where he speaks with an amalgamation of the two characters and is able to discuss everything from religious matters to their broken relationship. But as is the case with any analogy, the real question is why? Why does the game make such a clear connection between these two very different figures? By linking Dora to Dolores, the game allows us to get a clear picture of how Harry views his former fiance and sheds light on the hidden truth about their relationship. A truth that once exposed, spins Disco Elysium on its head and makes Harry an even more relatable character than he already is. First, let's review everything we know about Dora. The information we have on her trickles to the player in bits and pieces, some of which can only be discovered by choosing lines of dialogue that vaguely reference her, or by pursuing hidden objectives, like calling her via payphone. As mentioned earlier, Dora was Harry's fiancée, whom he dated long before he ever joined the RCM, back when he himself was a teacher, a gym teacher specifically, who presumably sponsored the Jam Rock Shuffle Club after school. At some point, they got engaged, and based on a combination of factors, from the way she describes her first impressions of Harry, to the letter found in the ledger, it appears that things were pretty great between them, and that their romance was a healthy one. But eventually, things fell apart. Harry's work with the RCM put a strain on their relationship, and Dora struggled to deal with his deteriorating mental state and the way the job affected his personality. Dora then left Harry, leaving him a broken man at the beginning of a doom spiral. By the time of the game, more than heartbreak separates the two former lovers, as Dora has moved to Morova, where she teaches at an academy and is pregnant with another man's child. Now, moving on to Dolores Day, again, most of what we know about her comes through side quests and other segments that the player needs to deliberately seek out. But unlike what we know about Dora, all of which is filtered through the memories of the notoriously unreliable Harry, what we know about Dolores is a bit more concrete. We can read books about her, and the information we do get through Harry comes from Encyclopedia, whose information generally seems to be a bit more trustworthy than the other voices in his head. It's more of a reflection of what he remembers about the world than projections of his desires or personifications of his many emotions. In any case, what we know about Dolores Day is that she started out as a woman of the court and advisor to Queen Irene, better known as Irene the Navigator. According to historical sources, she excelled in chess, philosophy, science, and theology. It was on Dolores' advice that Irene sent adventurers through the Pale and discovered the New World, the Insulinian Isola, where Revachal was eventually built. Soon after, Dolores Day was anointed as an innocence, a kind of supreme empress pope who rules over the nations of the world of Elysium with infallible authority. The decisions they make aren't considered to be actions or policies, but rather inevitabilities. They are, effectively, the conduits of humanity's destiny. Though we're told that she was beloved by all, and that only the Mesk state rejected innocentic rule, she was eventually killed by one of her secret service members, Thariers, as they're called, who believed that she was something more than human. He claimed to have touched her, and discovered that she was unnaturally warm, and said that he once witnessed her forgetting to breathe for more than 10 minutes. Now that we've summarized what we know about both characters, let's return to the question at hand. What do these two wildly different women, born 300 years apart, a teacher, a drunken cop's fiancé, and an empress pope who some claim wasn't truly human at all, have anything to do with each other? Well, clearly, they have everything to do with each other. Otherwise, Harry, in one of the game's most pivotal moments, wouldn't end up talking to a bizarre combination of the two characters in a dream sequence. It's a conversation that ties many of the game's narrative threads together, providing Harry with the reunion he's longed for, even if it doesn't end up the way he hoped it would. Why then would the developers choose to blend Dora and Dolores together at such an important point? 
I believe that fusing Dora and Dolores together accomplishes a number of things for the developers, starting with the root cause of Harry's amnesia. It is implied throughout the game that Harry's blackout was not the result of simply drinking enough alcohol to bring down Andre the Giant. It is frequently suggested that Harry lost his memory due to exposure to the Pale, specifically the hole in the world that can be found at the DeLorean Church of Humanism in Land's End. At some point prior to the events of the game, the officers of Precinct 41 shot up the place during a raid, resulting in damages to the stained glass mural of Dolores Day. Though it's never explicitly stated, it's likely that Harry was present for this, and given his high rank in the force, it's possible that he even led the operation. Thus, it's likely that he was so thoroughly overexposed to the pale through the hole in the world found in the roof of the church that a traumatic night of binge drinking suicidal ideation, and crashing his car caused the amnesia. This, in essence, makes the Dora Dolores fusion a literal symbol of the two things that brought about Harry's downfall. The alcoholism he used to cope with his breakup, and the overexposure to the pale he found in the church. This theory becomes all the more plausible if you consider the fact that the game only combines Dora and Dolores if you visit the church and look at the mural. I think you can interpret this as Harry never learning the truth about his amnesia, that it is, in fact, linked to the botched raid on the church, and not only the natural culmination of his years-long doom spiral. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, as this amalgamation also sheds light on how he views and feels about Dora. As I covered earlier, Dolores was a kind of empress pope, an object of worship for people across Elysium. By combining Dora with Dolores, the developers are showing us that Harry views her as a goddess, the innocence of his own tormented mind. Just as Dolores was viewed as infallible by her followers, so too does Harry view Dora as a person without flaw. Her views, her opinions, and her feelings are all sacred to him, to the point where she can do no wrong in his eyes. At no point, either during the phone call or the dream segment, can Harry respond to anything she does negatively? He treats everything she says as fact, as inevitabilities, rather than just the feelings of his former fiance. While this is made evident in the dream segment, it's reinforced throughout the game. Objects from his relationship with Dora, from the letter, to the chewing gum wrapper, and the tickets to the zoo that smell of apricots, are treated with the kind of reverence typically reserved for saintly artifacts. And if you pick the right dialogue options, you'll see that Harry essentially views his quest to get back in the good graces of Precinct 41 as an extension, a side quest if you will, on his greater journey to get back together with Dora, a holy crusade to prove his worth to his innocence. By fusing Dora and Dolores, the developers allow us to see this in a manner more heartbreaking and dramatic than Harry's sad lines ever could. But there is a very natural extension to this connection that tells us something deeper. The truth about the nature of Dora and Harry's relationship, a reality that eludes Harry throughout the game and will, unfortunately, likely continue to escape him in the years to come. No matter how inauthentic Dora and Dolores might appear to be, when you remove the veneer of worship, they are very flawed human people. With Dolores Day, her flaws are fairly well documented. She committed war crimes against the Mesk when they refused her rule, something that Harry can note during the dream state. As I said earlier, though he can't say anything that would suggest wrongdoing on Dora's part, he can do so for Dolores, and one of the things he can call her is a war criminal. She's also described as socially secluded and the least self-aware of the innocents. Her origins are also mysterious, as her husband simply vanished from historical record. All of this is to say that Dolores was, clearly, not the most perfect human to ever live, as the innocentic power structure led many to believe. So naturally, the question is, if the game is drawing a parallel between Dora and Dolores, and the latter is a worshipped but ultimately flawed person, wouldn't the same be true for the former? The answer, of course, is a resounding yes. As mentioned earlier, everything we know about Dora is filtered through Harry, who views her with an innocentic lens. 
so it's difficult to determine what type of person she truly was. But we can look at the relationship, and upon close inspection, it is clearly quite human. By this, I mean that it was not this idealized thing that fell apart out of nowhere, nor something that he brought about entirely on his own, but a typical adult relationship, where fault can be found on both sides, and the erosion of love came not swiftly, but gradually. Based on the letter in Harry's ledger, it seems that at one point, their relationship was indeed positive, passionate, and powerful. In the letter, Dora gushes about the happiness she feels at being with Harry, and expresses how she can't wait to come home to him at the end of each day. She even declares that he has a vast, infinite soul that she will always return to. Still, this is just one snapshot from one moment in the relationship, and probably early on, when the romance was still new, and both parties had their rose-colored glasses on. Because the deeper we dig, the more trouble we find for Harry and Dora. They were poor, to the point where, at times, they couldn't even afford electricity. When Harry started training for the RCM, it damaged their finances even further, likely because he wasn't making any money at the time. So to get by, they relied on assistance from her parents. Again, it's not easy to make heads or tails of anything that comes out of Harry's subconscious, but the issue of money comes up a lot during his conversation with Dora in the dream, and always in rather demeaning ways, like when she calls him poor and poverty-stricken. It might just be Harry projecting his own insecurities onto the Dora Dolores fusion, but considering they did have to rely on her parents' money to make ends meet, it's possible that this was, indeed, a source of conflict in their relationship. And if so, well, that's a bad look for Dora. They were both teachers, and I doubt teachers in Revishal make more money than they do in our world, so she had to know that money would be tight right from the get-go. And according to the game, Dora inspired Harry to join the RCM. It might have been something he was doing for her, for them, for the family he hoped to share with her, or perhaps it was something she directly encouraged him to do. Whatever the case may be, this was a pretty clear move by Harry to try to better their lot in the world, to get them out of poverty. It might not have been his primary reason for joining the force, but surely, if they were struggling financially, it had to have been a huge plus. A cop's salary is far better than a teacher's salary in just about every universe. And yet, as I said earlier, Harry's training with the RCM put a further strain on their finances, likely because he couldn't teach at the time, and thus wasn't bringing in any income. All of this is to say that Dora had to know what she was in for from a monetary perspective when she started dating Harry, and had to know how difficult things would become when he stopped working to train. The same is true of Harry's emotional state when he started working as a cop. She lived in Revachal. She knew what Martin Ayes was like, so she had to know what type of things Harry would see on the job, and if she truly loved him, if this was truly a relationship that was meant to last, if they were truly compatible, then she would have supported him, instead of taking issue with his sadness, as the dream segment implies. Now, before I go any further, let me be very clear that I am not insinuating that Harry is free from blame here. He made some serious mistakes, including taking up a demanding job like police work despite the fact that he clearly has an addictive personality. It's obvious that as he engaged more deeply with the RCM, he left Dora by the wayside, allowing the relationship to deteriorate. He also probably put a huge emotional burden on her, which he should have been bringing to someone like a therapist. Even Kim can suggest that if it weren't for the Disco Cop's tremendous detective work, he'd have a hard time being his partner. And he still has trouble with his actions at various points during the game, some of which are crazy at worst, and eccentric at best. So no, I am certainly not absolving Harry for his role in their relationship's decline. Rather, what I am getting at is the fact that there was clearly responsibility on both sides for how things turned out. As the necktie states, when Harry asks who broke his heart, You both did, Bratan. Deep down, you know it was both of you. The story of Harry and Dora is a love affair that started out hot and heavy, at a time when she thought he was cool, and when he was physically attracted to her. 
but relationships need more than that to last. They need to grow, evolve, and for both parties to respond to each other's ever-changing needs. That didn't happen with Harry and Dora. They simply weren't compatible. The relationship was not the rose-colored romance that Harry makes it out to be, where he lost the woman he loved thanks to nothing but his deepening doom spiral. They broke up because their relationship was as flawed and as human as Dolores Day, the innocence he's merged Dora with in his mind, as fragile as the stained glass window he shot up when he raided the church. This reality doesn't make the story of Harry any less tragic. In fact, in my view, it makes his suffering all the more real and his downfall more relatable. How many of us have beaten ourselves up over the end of a relationship when in fact we know deep down that there was fault on both sides and that no matter how hard we try to hide from that uncomfortable truth that there is no magic solution that could have fixed our doomed love affairs and no daring side quest that could have brought our beloved back home. I know I've been there back when I was younger before I was fortunate enough to be a married father of two. And if you so much as search for a topic on Dora, or something related to her, on any Disco Elysium forum or Reddit, you'll inevitably find people commenting that they're just as hung up on their lost loves as Harry is with Dora. I've seen countless such posts. I empathize with them. Like I said, I know how it feels. But by connecting Dora to Dolores in his dreams, Harry's subconscious is trying to tell him something that I myself had to realize. That everyone who's gotten past this type of stricken longing understands eventually. That the person you're after is no innocence. And that the relationship you miss was not infallible, but as human and as broken as the stained glass window in the church at Land's End. And in a game as full of inspirational messaging as Disco Elysium, that's what makes Dora Ingerland and Dolores Day so important. Thanks for watching. This is my third video in an ongoing series of essays on Disco Elysium. I'm not sure what topic I'll cover next, but I'm kicking the tires on Kuno and the Hardy Boys. If you have any suggestions, let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. Huge shout out to Isla Sound for allowing me to use her Disco Elysium fan music for this video. Isla is an incredibly talented composer who's created a ton of awesome music, including an album full of fan music inspired by the game. Be sure to check out all of her content by following the link to her channel down in the description box. If you enjoy this type of content, please be sure to like, subscribe, and consider supporting me on Patreon or through a YouTube channel membership. See you guys next time.